what you have to do is rein in government spending. I, I think the guy was a, a complete buffoon and a, actually a dangerous leader. You can't move in the United States without some political or bureaucratic regulation tangled around you. Welcome to Capital.com's first big interview of 2023. Today we're joined by Professor Steve Hankey. We're going to be running a health check on the US economy, whether we believe it's in a permanent decline and how this could impact global markets. Steve Hankey is a professor of applied economics at John Hopkins University. He's worked as an economic advisor for government dating back to the Reagan administration. He's also a columnist and a currency and commodities trader. Our guest is not connected with Capital.com and any views he may express are personal to him and do not constitute any trading advice, nor do they represent Capital.com. Well, Professor Steve Hankey, welcome. We're here today with the intent of doing a little bit of a health check on the US economy. So my first question to you is, do you believe that the American economy is is inevitable to head into a recession in 2023. To make a long story short, Danielle, yes. And and what this gets into is it's something between the, the signal and the noise. And and every day we get financial data and and uh, of one sort or another. Uh, and and uh, the, not only financial data but economic data about things like what's going on in the labor market and and, uh, and various product markets and so forth. So so that really is uh, not irrelevant, but it's it's kind of noise in the system. The signal is what is happening to the money supply because the money supply changes eventually get transmitted first with, with a lag of about one to nine months into changes in asset prices, changes in real estate prices, uh, changes obviously in the stock market. And then with another lag of a little longer, about six to 18 months after those signal changes, after the money supply sub substantively change, we get uh, changes in real economic activity. So that gets into the recession issue that you just brought up. And then the last thing that comes with a lag of about a year or two years is inflation. We get changes in the price index. So, so the signal is sustained changes in the money supply. And from that, you get these changes in asset prices. And then a little later, changes in real economic activity. And then late, later than that, changes in inflation. So what we've had in the U.S. is a situation where if you look at the signal, it was just incredible in 2020 and 2021 that the Fed was accelerating the money supply at, at an unprecedented rate. In fact, if you look at uh, the, the money supply growth from March and June uh, of 2020, it actually was increasing at an annualized 63% per year. Annualized, it's never happened before. So we had this huge increase in the money supply, and then you start, that's the signal, and then you start the transmission. Asset prices went up, of course, the stock market went, went up, then, then you had a boom in the economy, and then, and then we had the highest inflation we've had in 40 years in the United States. And, and the reason, I work with John Greenwood uh, on this, and, and John and I, in, in February of 2021, indicated that we were going to have not a temporary, but a persistent inflation. Then in July of 2021, we actually put some numbers on it and said it would end up in a range of between 6 and 9%. Well, that's more or less hit the bullseye. The, the, the top inflation number we had was in June. Uh, year over year, nine point one percent. So, so that was the that was the kind of signal of the boom. Now, you you kind of alluded to this. We've had a tremendous drop, an unprecedented drop 
and the rate of growth in the money supply. So the signal has essentially gone negative on us. In fact, if you look at the last nine months, the money supply has declined. It's, it's, it's shrunk by about two and a half percent. This is unprecedented too. I mean, you have to go back to 1929 and 1937 to find shrinkages like this. Now, what does that mean? That, that means that with these lags, you will get in 2023, given this profile that I've just given you of the money supply, slamming on the brakes, you'll get a recession in 2023. And now John Greenwood and I have, have actually just over the weekend revised our view on where inflation is going to be. We thought before we saw all this negative quantitative tightening that the Fed is doing, increasing the federal funds rate as they've been doing. Before we saw the recent drop, particularly the December number that just came out was a big negative number in the money supply. We, we thought that the inflation at the end of 2023 looked like it was going to be around four or five percent. Now, we, we think inflation is basically over and we might end up with an, an inflation rate that's pro- close to zero by the end of 2023. I also want to talk about interest rates because we know that interest rates at the end of the day are determined by the demand for credit and also the confidence in the economy. So I want to get two things from you. One, where do you actually think um, rates will be at the end of the year? Realistically, how do you think the Fed's going to p- behave? And where do you think they should be regardless of what happens? Let me just say, I'll go with the market. I I mean, the only objective data that we have right now, the consensus in the market, people with skin in the game are indicating, as you've said, that the Fed funds rate will come in a peak at a little under five and and go down towards the end of the year. Uh, That's probably okay. Right now, they're four and a quarter. And, and, and by the way, they've increased uh, the, the Fed funds rates by four and a quarter percent over the March to December 2022 period. Uh, that's the most they've ever increased in that short a period of time in four decades. So it's a dramatic increase up to where they are now. And, and they'll go a little higher. They'll keep going. I think eventually they might. And what might throw the market prediction off is that if we do have a liquidity crisis and, and we really start going into a sharp recession, they, they might pivot and start reducing rates more rapidly than the market anticipates. But that, that's kind of an, an outlier. We, we could have a liquidity crisis, actually. With the money supply shrinking like this, that is a possibility. But again, they're focused on interest rates, not not the money supply, and and that's a very dangerous way to be flying an airplane. Okay, so I also want to ask you now um, quickly about markets because we've seen recently that bad economic data has been good for the market, especially for the stock market, and that is again on that back of the change in perception of how the Federal Reserve is going to act. Are we now concerned that okay, it's not only about the Federal Reserve and their pivot, but markets are also looking at what this data actually means for the economy and the fact that we may not see a soft landing in 2023 as markets were originally expecting. Yes, I, 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 I think if and, and until the uh, recession that I think is certain actually gets into focus, you'll continue to get this bad data is good for the markets kind of situation coming in. But once people start staring at the recession and see that, <laughs> Is, 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 is something that's coming down the pike for sure. I think that will change because as economic activity goes down, of course, sales go down, uh, margins go down, profits go down. Profit. Remember, profits, uh, the, the adjustments and the consensus for profits has gone down, down, down. It's been notching down. So that will start overtaking the anticipation that 
the interest rates have peaked and are coming down. In other words, what's what's keeping the market up to in a, to make a long story short from what you said is is that the expectation is that the interest rates won't go up by very much more and 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 in fact will start sliding off and coming down and and uh, that bad news in the market just reinforces that kind of view and that that happens to be good for the market because of the, the expectation about interest rates but if earnings reductions and adjustments are factored in and and that will come with a recession then that'll start weighing on, weighing on the market so it's it's going to be a tug of war <laughs> And interest rates, interest rates softening up a little bit is good for the market, but certainly a recession and earnings coming down is not good for the market. Now, I know you mentioned just earlier that inflation, in your view, is no longer a threat to the American economy. So how do you think that fiscal policy should be acting? Should we be increasing taxes? I know there's been a lot of lobbying for that lately, mostly on the back of inflation being perceived as one of the biggest threats for the economy. Well, I, what you have to do is rein in government spending. It, it's it's the you, you've got G government and T taxes <laughs> and, and you don't want to raise T. You want to reduce G. And, and this is a Swiss debt break thing. If you, if you they they had a they had a referendum in in Switzerland and the referendum put in the break and the break essentially says that you can't have government creep into the economy and the reason you can't is that you cap the growth rate in government spending at a maximum of rate of growth equal to the potential growth rate in the economy. So if the if the economy's potential growth rate is in real terms six two percent in the United States, then the growth in government could only be two percent. So the proportion taken up by the government, the the unproductive sector, would be capped. And that's the Swiss have been very successful with this, by the way. The break, the break has has worked like a charm. They they've actually reduced, by the way. The debt to GDP ratio in Switzerland, it's only about 20% now. It's its just a little over 20%. It actually was down a little over 18% uh, when COVID hit in 2020, and, and it's gone up just a little bit, but not, not very much. The Swiss get agitated when the, when the debt to GDP ratio is 20%. It's over 100 percent in the United States. I want to get your views on the U.S. dollar and just in general, as the um, Federal Reserve was perceived to be tightening and to becoming uh, stricter in the economy and reducing that supply in the economy, as we were talking about earlier, we saw that dollar dominance um, across the board. Then we saw that flip right around October as we started to see the end of that policy tightening um, and the end potentially of this reduced supply in the economy. What are your views for 2023 for the dollar? Ultimately, e either a, a liquidity crisis would, would force the Fed to pivot very fast or, or the recession will, will cause a pivot. And both of those pivots mean uh, a softening of interest rates and, and, and that will keep the, the dollar on its back foot. Okay, let's talk about now about America's position um, in, the, in the world. And I want to ask you, do you accept that America is in a permanent economic, political and military decline? That's a, that's a difficult question to answer. One thing, let, let me talk a little bit about the decline. I, I, think, I think since 9-11, uh, 2001, the, the U.S. has been in a... Uh, slow decline. Our, our potential GDP growth at that time, that's 9-11, remember when the Twin Towers were hit and so forth, 2001, that's, that's about a, a generation ago. Potential growth in the U.S. was about 4% per annum, and, and now it's hardly over 2%. That's a potential. So by that measure, things, things are going down. If you look at debt to GDP, that, that's gone up. The debt uh, being incurred by the U.S. has gone up. I think 
what we should do instead of arguing about the debt limit and, and uh, the hassle we're going through over that right now, they should be focused in Washington on something like a Swiss debt break where you actually limit the increase in government expenditures to put a cap on it so they can't go up any faster than the rate of growth in the economy, the, the potential growth rate in the economy. And, and in that way, you keep the gov government and the size of the government reined in. And, and that's good because that's one reason, by the way, that this growth potential thing has gone down in the United States since about 2001. You've got more government involved. The government's bigger. The government regulations are bigger. The taxes are bigger. All of these supply, these are, this is just simple supply side economics. The more the government politicizes things and get, intervenes and gets her finger in the, in the pie, the smaller the potential growth rate, the smaller the potential pie will actually be. So, so that's, that's one part of it. Too much government, too much politicization, suggest weakness and and we're seeing that weakness with this potential growth rate you know cut in 20 years it's it's been cut in half it's a, it's a pretty big slice that's been taken out of the thing then then we, we we've already gone over monetary instability we've got the fed since 2020 they've given us the the biggest whiplash we've ever had in history an explosion of the money supply, the huge inflation, and, and now all of a sudden the brakes have been slammed on and, and we're going to have a recession and, and prices will, will as I say, John Greenwood and I think inflation is basically over now, given this huge squeeze in the, in the money supply. And in the military part of things, of course, where the U.S. is financing uh, to a large extent the war with Russia and three three and a half percent of GDP is ground up by military expenditures in the United States. Now that that's just money down a rat hole. That that doesn't produce anything. Mm -hmm. And and this this gets into something one of my former professors, famous economist Kenneth Bolding, Actually, a Brit. He's from was from born in Liverpool. Uh, very famous economist. Bolding used to like to quip, "Wealth creates power, and power destroys wealth." So that's my that's my summary of the United States. It is an empire. It's probably the only empire in the United States. And when you look at empire, one way to get it, you you mentioned military, Daniela. The U.S. has 750 military bases overseas. And how many does China have? They have five. How many does Russia have? They have 36. So if you add China and Russia together, you get 41 bases versus 750 of the United States. So the United States has 18 times more bases overseas. Now, now, you Brits, you see, you, you were an empire until the First World War, and a lot of that is still a residual. The second highest uh, number of bases by any country in the world is Brit Britain. The UK has 145. So with empire, you, you, you have military, and, and, and you, you have a lot of waste, and you have all these bases and everything. And, and again, Ken Boulding, wealth creates power and power destroys wealth. What do you think is the single most important thing that America could do to halt its perceived decline? Well, the first big thing is to re rein in the lunacy with the, 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 with the military. So point, point number one is uh, rein in the military uh, we've got 750 bases overseas. We're meddling all over the place. You know, the, the, you, you name the country. Believe me, the U.S. has her fingers in it. The the empire is at work, full speed, and so that that would be one thing. 
But the overall thing is reducing the politicization of life in the United States. And what I mean by that is you can't move in the United States without some political or bureaucratic regulation or red piece of red tape tangled around you. And, and that's what reigns in the creativity, innovation, productivity, growth potential, wealth, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Freer is better. And, and that's why someplace, look, the example I like to give, look at Singapore. Singapore became independent in 1965. It was one of the poorest places in the world. Terrible situation, almost ready to go to civil war. And a great leader came, Lee Kuan Yew. And he, he put in place liberal economic policies, free trade. You ask about trade. They, they, they had complete free trade. They didn't pass the begging bowl. No foreign aid. Uh, competition. They wanted competition. Why? Because they, that increases potential, increases productivity. How do you get competition? You, it, you get it with free trade. And now what do, you, what do you have Singapore? Singapore is one of the rich, either number one or number two. I think it's actually number two behind Luxembourg in terms of per GDP per capita. But that, that's been in a, in a relatively short period of time, 1965 until today, going from one of the poorest places in the world to one of the richest. So if you get politics out and run a, 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 a lean and clean machine, uh, you can grow pretty fast. I'm not saying Lee Kuan Yew was perfect. I'm not saying Singapore was perfect. But I am saying overall, it, it was a dramatic change. Now, also, if you, now, that was a small place. Let's talk about a big place. Let's talk about China. What, what, what have been the, the most revolutionary free market introduction and, and reforms it, probably in the history of man, 1979, Deng made his speech and started opening China up and liberalizing China and privatizing China and so forth. And where are they now? Great. Let's talk about now about trade relationships. And you mentioned earlier regulations. Now, I want to ask you, as the economic environment and conditions become more challenging, do you think that America is likely to become more or less protectionist as an, a global economy? I think it's becoming more protectionist. And uh, this, again, is bad news because it, 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 it hurts Americans. I mean, it it drives up the cost of everything and 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 does uh, reduce again it's an intervention and, and, and anti-liberal anti-free market anti-laissez-faire kind of policy that drags the potential of the country down so again that that's part of this 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 slide we've been on for two decades of down and, and if you if you look at it even by things by the economic freedom of the world uh, put out by the Fraser Institute and the Cato Institute that that thing has been going down the, the measure of overall economic freedom in the United States it peaked in about 2006 and has been going down and and down pretty sharply by the way since 2019. Quite, quite a reduction. So, so there are different kinds of metrics and different kinds of things you can, you can measure, but they're, they're, they're all going down. Okay, and just to finish off, we'll leave the US a little bit and come closer to us. Um, what are your views on the euro and its uh, potential for the future? And also, do you think that Brexit was a good idea? Well, the, the the euro will remain a significant regional currency. It's it's not a it's not really an international currency, but but it is at least right now it's probably the second most important currency in the world, and and the most important price in the world actually 
as Bob Mundell used to always like to remind me, is the dollar euro exchange rate. That's that's the most important price in the world. So uh, it's it's important. It's not going away. Uh, it's it's very uh, the e, the ECB is, is I, I think is roughly as incompetent as the Fed. So so remember currencies. It's always two two sides of a coin, and you've got two incompetents. So it's kind of a standoff. Uh, in, in in a way, the only thing advantage that U.S. has, it, it's it is an empire, and it's represented by you know a huge capital market, and and that's one one reason, by the way, why the dollar has retained as much strength as it has right now. It's just the capital market, the the attraction into the U.S. capital market, and which means. The dollar it's dollar denominated so so that's one thing brexit uh, in in principle i thought it was a good thing in practice uh i i think boris johnson has been i mean he, he is pretty much an incompetent buffoon and it's fairly clear that he's made a hell of a mess out of things and and now he's got britain in in this war with russia which is complete insanity for for a, a, a nation like Great Britain to be fooling around with this much military expenditure and and messing around I mean you've got m16 is more active than than ever I, I mean it, it's kind of ridiculous the Britain's big problem it, it is no longer an empire it tries to act like one and and that is bad news for Brits. So I, I think Great Britain is in, in actually in great, uh, huge trouble. Uh, and, and, and that's primarily thanks to Boris Johnson. I, I think the guy was a, a complete buffoon and uh, a, actually a dangerous uh, leader. Well, it's great to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you so much, Professor Steve Hankey, for joining us today to talk about your expectations for 2023 and America's global position. Well, thank you for having me, Danielle. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for watching. Remember that the price of stocks and shares may vary depending on changing market conditions. You can read more of our analysis by clicking on the links in the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to stay alerted to our regular chart analysis videos each week and other explainers on big financial topics of the day.